Welcome to Understanding Irish Muslims. My name is Peter Carney. While Muslims have been living and coming to Ireland for about 400 years, it was not until 1976 that Ireland's first mosque opened its doors on Harrington Street on Dublin's south side. And in 1987, the first purpose-built mosque was erected in Ballyhonas in the west of Ireland. Despite this long history, it was not until the early 90s that the Muslim population in Ireland started to grow. And today, it is estimated that there are around 60,000 Muslims in Ireland. This is a four-part documentary, and in this episode, I examine the history and experience of Muslims in Ireland, what is important to them, as well as talking about their identity and the media. So why did Muslims decide to make Ireland their home? Abdul Hasib, from the Clongriffin Mosque on Dublin's north side, gave me a brief insight into what brought Muslims here in recent times. Most of us here are economic migrants, hmm. and we're here to work, uh, make a living, uh, make a life for ourselves. Dr Ali Salim, of the Islamic Cultural Centre of Ireland on Dublin Southside, explained why Muslims first began to settle in Ireland in the late 1940s. They arrived in Ireland as students coming to study medicine in the Royal College of Surgeons. Well, these Muslim students, said they, the plan was to finish their study and then go back uh, to their countries. Uh, some of them got married to Irish women and they got settled in Ireland. People who came to this country, they felt really comfortable here. Mm. So they were welcomed and they found that there also opportunity. So it met the needs of Muslim immigrants and also the need of the indigenous people at the time. Dr. Oliver Sharbrut from the Study of Religions Department, University College Cork, talked about the early history of Muslims in Ireland and the special relationship that brought Muslims here in more recent times. The first known example of this would be a person called uh, Sakadeen Muhammad, um, who um, was a soldier in the army of the British East India Company and his officer was from Cork. And uh, he actually introduced the word shampoo into the English language, which I think shampoo means just a head massage. The other prominent figure who settled in Ireland, again, a similar context is uh, Mia Aulad Ali, who uh, came from uh, India as well, British India. Um, he was part of the kind of political intellectual elite and somehow Mia Ali got a position as professor of Arabic at Trinity College Dublin and quite interestingly he was also very much involved in um, movements for the revival of the Irish language I mean there was a society for the preservation of the Irish language in terms of a communal presence a kind of a permanent communal presence a sense of a, a Muslim community that began in the 1950s mm. um, and we talk here basically of the pioneers were South African students. Again, quite interesting identity dynamics. There were South Africans, Indians in terms of their ethnicity, Muslims, not all of them, there were also Hindus and others. Um, In terms of the religious background, they came um, to study medicine in Ireland at UCD, Royal College of Surgeons. And it was through the mediation of the Valera that the forced cohort began to study medicine uh, at UCD, I think, 47 the, the link between the South African, South Asian community and De Valera was the Aga Khan. Today, the majority of Irish Muslims live in Dublin, so we took to the streets of the capital to hear what ordinary people know about present-day Muslims in Ireland. A woman with the, just her two eyes looking out, uh, searching meats they don't eat. Just ordinary people. Like, the Muslims can be black, they can be Asian, they can be anything. The war in Iraq, they pray every morning. Uh, like, they live the same life, like, they're just different religions, like religions. It's like they should get along, like Sharia law. Sharia law, and what do you know about Sharia law? It's really sexist. There's no problem with them in Ireland. It's just a lot of people do associate them with, you know, terrorism and stuff. And to be honest, I know that's not true. Yeah. But the opinion in Ireland wouldn't be the same. Terrorism. Where do you get that opinion from? Television every day. Every and day. do you think that's a fair opinion? But I don't think so. It's fair, you know. I think it's with the news. It sort of gives you a bad impression. I think that there's a lot of anti-Muslim bigotry in Ireland and a lot of kind of alarm for no reason, which is really unfortunate. I don't think they're treated as fairly as they need to be. Okay. And why is that, do you think? I just think uh, because of racism. And do you know any Muslims yourself? Yeah. They're in my school. Do you know any Muslims yourself? Not personally. Do you know many Muslims? None at all. That's probably why you have a bad opinion, because you don't know enough about them. You don't right. Don't know the way of life and stuff. like. Do you know many Muslims? No. Okay. I know there's a Muslim uh, churches. 
Yeah, the masks. The masks. There's a few of my school, but like I don't know them. Like I know of them. There isn't really a lot of mixing. Mm. We don't really have any Muslim friends there. Dries Bell Majdu from Morocco came to Ireland in the early 1970s and talked about the generosity he experienced when he first arrived and his current disappointment with Muslim leadership in Ireland. As far as I know, I had more help right. than the Irish people. I had people here who helped me to set up. I had people who advised me. I had people who signed for me in the bank. They said, they'll pay for me. Now, you, your wife is, is not Muslim. Is that unusual for Muslim to marry? No, Muslim? it's not unusual. Uh -huh. There's nothing in the book to tell me it's unusual. Nothing in the Quran? Yeah. Yeah. My wife head to her church. She never stopped me and never stopped her. I head to my mosque and she never stopped me. Yeah. When you are here for 15 years on your own and nobody with you to tell you Salaamu Alaikum yeah. or to tell me don't read the Quran this way, read it that way or Ramadan, it's 9 o'clock, not 5 to 9. That was the happiest moment in my life. I used to pray to God. Mm -hmm. I used to do Ramadan for myself. But now it's pity. One man comes tell me a dress white. One man tell me you mustn't show a photograph of your mother. The worst. I don't see any leader of our Muslim community here coming to defend my right or to tell that man is wrong or I am wrong. That's the most hurtful thing I am suffering now. Hiba Aberween from the European Forum of Muslim Women explain why she wears the hijab. I think as we have been saying that a hijab is part of all religions. Mm -hmm. The head cover, like Mary's poster there, is wearing a headscarf. Jewish would have the headscarf. It, it is there in all the religions. So, and it is from God, it's not from men. So uh, when I was wearing the scarf, I wore it because it is something special between me and God. I feel like I want to be good in matter of my religion, so I, I decided to wear it. Hawa Ibrahim from Nigeria is a human rights activist and was a visiting professor at Harvard Divinity School from 2010 to 2013, and she's also a Sharia law author. She dealt with the controversial area of stoning and how difficult it actually is to secure a conviction in this way. We have been trying to find out where is the root of the stoning to death coming from? Where did we get it to make it part of the Sharia in the northern Nigeria? And I have not arrived yet. But in my small research, I think it is based on some of the hadiths, which is like a subsidiary legislation. Mm -hmm. And it's like the jurisprudence mm, may not have said that. But the argument on the other side is that the practice of the Holy Prophet during his time mm. is Sunni, is Sunnah. And because it's Sunnah, then I have no right to argue that it cannot be done. Mm. Because when you look at what it will take to convict for stoning, it's practically impossible to convict for stoning. Mm. It's not. Mm. One of the provisions is no judge can sit on a case of adultery or zina unless that judge himself is clean. Mm. Actually, if you look very closely, that judge must be a saint. You cannot convict because you cannot find four witnesses. Yeah. You cannot convict on as a pregnancy as a conclusive proof. Actually, you cannot even convict on confession. Two of the main denominations in Islam are Sunni and Shia. Dr. Salim explains these differences from a Sunni point of view. The Prophet Muhammad died and he didn't appoint anybody after him to be mm. the leader. And that raised a question for Muslims. They, for the first time, they had a question that was not raised in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. The majority of Muslims, they said, whoever is elected. But the minority said it has to be somebody having blood relation to the Prophet. Mm. And that minority opinion uh, um, was the Shia opinion. Dr. Ali Al Saleh, Imam at the Shia Mosque in Milltown on Dublin Southside, told me about the differences between Sunni and Shia Muslims from a Shia point of view. Now the Shia believe that after Rasulullah, the uh, Islam is in the hand uh, of his progeny. 
Okay. Uh, the Sunni, they said, no, the Islam after uh, Rasulullah between all Muslims. Mm -hmm. We believe the chaos in which Muslims now live uh, because of that. Right. <laughs> you see, yeah. and that is why uh, we don't see those things. So it is mostly not that deep. Uh -huh. When they pray, they pray together. If you are not Muslim, you maybe you will not aware who is Shia, who is Sunni. Nasreen Mahdi, a Shia Muslim, Explain the differences between Sunni and Shia from our own point of view. There's not much difference to really tell you the truth. It's just the historical side, I think, would be, which would sort of differ us, that we would sort of be different, is how we interpreted the history of Islam. Um, so it does go back to the start of Islam, really. But living in Ireland, living as myself, you couldn't label us, if we were all together differently, we wouldn't look any different. And we do the same prayers, the same... Um, fasting, the same month of fasting, the same Hajj, everything would be exactly the same. However, the place of other denomination in Islam is disputed by some. We don't consider Alawi, we don't consider Duruz, we don't consider Ahmadi, we, go, we don't consider Baha'i or Muslim. They have their own religion, mm. but their Islam is not clear to us. Dr. Mamoun Rashid, who is an Ahmadi Muslim in Galway, explains the background of this dispute. I boil it down to lack of understanding. Mm. We have the same Quran, we have the same uh, religion, we have the same Holy Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. The division where it starts is just out of identity of the, the promised Messiah, of the promised reformer. Just like the Christians, the mainstream Muslims believe that Jesus has gone to heavens and is going to come back alive in, a, in the same body that it went up in. He was resurrected and is going to come back. We believe that he was alive, he was taken off the cross and he died, he migrated out of uh, Jerusalem and he migrated towards India and he died and he's buried there. And then the difference is then who we claim is the second coming of Jesus. Just that's where the uh, division has, has been. So we believe that the second coming of Jesus happened in the personage of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. He was born in Qadian in a village in India. And, and he pro proclaimed that he was the promised Messiah after getting news from God, after get, getting revelation from God Almighty. And so that's, it's just a matter of identity of the second coming of Jesus rather than any fundamental difference in faith. Dr. Rashid also demonstrated further connections between Muslims, Ireland and Christianity when he explained the name of their new mosque. Now, there's some, an inscription written above the door. What, what is that? Um, it's in Irish, so I hope my, your Irish is better than mine. <laughs> yeah, mosque on Magdal Mira, so Mosque yeah. of the Virgin Mary. Mosque of the Virgin Mary. Yes. Now, that might sound strange for people who don't know much about Islam, that it, your mosque is named after the Virgin Mary. Can you, can you explain, please? <laughs> Mary um, has a special place in Islam. The state of a Muslim or a believer is compared to that of the the Mary of Mary, father, mother of Jesus. That a, a believer, uh, how he protects his faith is like that, like the, the state of him is that of of Mary. So in that perspective, Mary is revered in Islam, but not as mother of God, but as a chaste, pious woman. Dr. Salim broadened our understanding of some well-known Islamic terms. Jihad is one of the best words in Islam because jihad means to struggle and people only struggle to improve something. Mm. Yeah. And I believe like throughout all our day we are practicing jihad but just people are not aware of it. You mm. see, like uh, uh, to study and learn something that is an act of jihad. Mm. To be a good Muslim, to have morality, that's a jihad. It's just like, let's say, for example, if you walk in the street and all of a sudden you find a wallet full of money, and then you just take this wallet and look for a contact number or something like this and call the person and give him the, his money back. That is jihad because now everybody is facing a bit of difficulty because of the recession. But also jihad, jihad means, means to defend the people's freedom. Mm. Yeah. So if people's freedom is suppressed, then the Muslims should help them to get the freedom. Yeah. Fatwa uh, refers to a statement uh, 
made by a Muslim scholar uh, to tell Muslims whether something is permissible or not permissible. Muslims do not refer to their imams as holy people. We don't believe that there is a holy man. We don't believe that there is a holy woman either. The imams do not claim that they are mediators between people and God. Yeah. Our relation with God is a very direct relation. No mediator from yeah. a Muslim point of view. Well, they, I, so imams, you don't have a thing called confession? We don't have confession, right. no. no. You see, uh, the imams, they give personal advice. Mm. They give social advice. They answer people's questions. It's called Taliban because it has been founded by students. Right. And that's why it's been given this. Uh, it's been given this name, and the Qaeda. If you study Arabic, then the Qaeda will be grammar. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but not the Qaeda over there. But also the Qaeda means base. Base. Yes, and it could be a military base, or it could be a base for anything. But uh, we do use these words in in our language, but in the uh, in different contexts. The Muslims believe that all prophets had beards. So it's it's uh, there is a, a a religious significance for having a, a beard, but what is of greater significance is your behaviour. The Dower Table is a familiar sight around many towns and cities in Ireland at weekends. Adam Saba explains the purpose of this table. Initially, what it was, what it was was uh, it was a table set up back years back actually by a young man after the September 11th attacks. Because I mean, if I went I went to school at the time and. I had a lot of hostility towards me after those events and so did my friend at the time. So what he did was he, he wanted to set up a table somewhere to give out information about Islam, to clarify the misconceptions that the people had. And this is what it is, it's, it's a continuation of that work. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Muslims are called to prayer five times per day. I spent some time with Imam Mishmal in the Black Pits Mosque, just off Clombrassel Street in Dublin Southside. We explain what is being said during this time. It's basically um, in the Arabic language. It was a call to prayer, which basically means. God is the greatest, God is the greatest, there is no God but Allah. And I testify that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the servant of God. I testify that Prophet Muhammad is the servant of God. Okay. And then also part of the call is come for prayer, come for prayer, come towards success, come towards success. God is the greatest and there is no God but Allah. Muslims who came to Ireland from other countries have started to raise families here, which has raised questions over identity. Dr. Salim explained further. Muslims who came to live in Ireland, who have children brought up in this country, if they think that these children will have identically the same culture like, like, like theirs, mm. they are deceiving themselves. I think what would be interesting to observe is what is happening with the second generation, of their children, they're just coming of age. Born in Belfast to Pakistani parents, Bilal Yaqub told me about the unique identity crisis that exists there. It always it depends on the group of people you grow up with. Right. And, you know, your parents do have a lot of input into that when you're young, you know. I mean, if your parents wanted to, they could take you to the Islamic Centre where you meet a lot of Muslims and you know your identity. Or they could be happy for you to be with non-Muslim friends. Now, if those non-Muslim friends are all Protestants, mm. you might be, you know, we'll have a joke here, are you a Protestant or a Catholic Muslim? Yeah. You know, <laughs> because I, I have friends on both sides. Right, you know. yeah. Yeah, after Woolwich, we had a paint bomb thrown at the top of the window and paint splattered everywhere. No one was hurt, thankfully. Mm. Uh, we had members of Sinn Féin come down and voice their support for us in the media, you know. We didn't have anyone from the Loyalist side, which is disappointing. Des Delaney, a PhD student at Dublin City University, has researched the area of Sunni Muslims in Dublin extensively. You could say that there is, to a certain sense, an identity crisis. Mm. Um, and this identity crisis has to do with their private lives within their families and their public lives as well. So within their families, very much the so, some parents, this is only some parents, um, may have a more cultural Islam. 
So this is where our Islam has has a lot of cultural traditions connected into it, and um, that have arrived with them. But some of the younger generation don't want to take on board these cultural traditions, mm. uh, and maybe nationalism, as you know, Irish nationalism, would would not be that strong. Mm. But they do feel a very strong sense of being an Irish citizen. As an Ahmadi Muslim, Dr. Rashid in Galway told me the order identity takes for him. As an Ahmadi Muslim, uh, I am taught that I should be loyal to my faith, my country and my nation. So my faith being Islam, my country being an island and my nation being Pakistani. When in Kerry, I spoke with Dr. Rizwan Khan about identity. You are where you are. Mm. That's what we believe. Like you know, because it's it's you have to embrace where you are, and that's the way it comes from the Prophet as well. When he was in Mecca, he loves that town. But when he moved to Medina, he was always in Medina. Then there was no Saudi Arabia at that time anyway. Yeah. So like, I believe that like we are here, we are serving the people, and people embraced us as well, and we should be calling proudly ourselves Irish Muslim. Over the course of making this radio documentary, the international media came in for a lot of criticism from Irish Muslims. This is a sample of what some of them had to say. See, like you can't allocate all the blame on the media people. The Irish media is uh, is not against Muslims, mm-hmm. no. On the other hand, you see, yes, there are uh, some Muslims who give bad impression about Islam. Mm-hmm. So they contribute to the misunderstanding of, of Islam. Every time there's like a crime or something, they're first identified by the religion. They'd say like a Muslim man was found Whereas if someone of a Christian was to like rob a bank or kill someone, they never say a 45-year-old Christian man. He, he's not identified by his religion. Um, so yeah, it's very it's very difficult to just kind of sit back and watch. And every every time there's something negative, there's, they attribute the word Muslim to. When they show you like they call, I say like on the news, they say a Muslim, and then they show you a picture, and then slowly if they keep doing that and doing that, it sinks into your head. Oh, Muslims, and then. Uh, as a word tag that is tagged in your head and you're all oh, Muslims are terrorists or Muslims okay. are blah, blah blah so it's it's basically some of the messages yeah. that are sent to people through the media okay. media has to separate Muslim from Arab like I remember when the two Chechens did the whole Boston whatever the whatever the situation was um, there was a lot of tweets and they were like but how are they Muslim they're white and they're not wearing they don't have a turban they don't have a beard going on and I was like Those Muslims are not always brown and Arab like it's not it's not an ethnicity it's a religion okay. you just don't get that because of the the way the media portrays Muslims. I am half Irish and half Kuwaiti so um, for me um, just in general like I, I would identify myself Muslim first before Kuwait or Irish like my mom is Irish and my dad is from Kuwait so I would it's sometimes it, like being from two different backgrounds, two very different cultures, it's hard to identify and fit in each one. You feel like you're not Kuwaiti enough for the Kuwaitis and you're not Irish enough for the Irish. So you just kind of, I, I identify, identify myself like first and foremost as a Muslim. I asked a number of Irish Muslims if they'd ever experienced any discrimination based on their religion. And people who wear the headscarf, have you uh, picked up any kind of negative feedback from anybody anywhere at any time? I know, I know from my friend when she started wearing it, she actually lost like all her friends. They literally just stopped hanging around with her. But um, I was really lucky in that, like my friends were like, they're down to earth and they're really genuine. So like they were fine with it. Um, and they kept like asking questions. Some people were too shy to ask questions. They just think like it's one of those things you don't ask questions about. Like ask simple questions like do you sleep in this or do you shower in this and stuff like that. But they never ask you like why like why do you actually wear it? And I had like one friend when she started wearing it, all her friends like they were Irish, they wore it with her just for the first day, just to show really? her support. Okay. So like it, it depends on your friends, I suppose, yeah. For us if we walk down the street wearing a headscarf, people would immediately know that we're Muslim. So to have that kind of identification immediately shows that how women are important in Islam. And for us, like as well, like they say that if a man gets married, he completes half his religion. James Carr, a PhD candidate at the University of Limerick, has researched this area extensively and suggests a new way of approaching the problem. You know, for you, me, and for the general public, racism has a certain resonance. We know what it means. If, if I say somebody was exposed to a racist attack, I know they were t- attacked on the basis of their identity, on the basis of who they are, their background, whether it be migrant, whether it be someone who's second, third, fourth generation immigrant here. So that's why um, I refer to, anti- to anti-Muslim racism as anti-Muslim racism as opposed to Islamophobia. I think if you're going to um, try to 
catalyse some, I mean, and I say this kind of humbly, if, if you're going to try and catalyse some sort of change, then you need to start getting people to think about something, how it manifests for people. One of the first places Muslims will experience integration with non-Muslims is in the school environment. Omar El Tawil told us about his experiences of first going to school in Ireland. I had a bit of trouble fitting in sometimes in schools. Uh, at first I tried a boys only school and I didn't really get far with that. It was just, I think I was too different or I just didn't fit in. And then I went to a mixed school. Um, again, it was hard fitting in, but when I did fit in, I was made feel very welcome and, and I was, I was, people were very open to understanding what we were about. And I even, I attended, I attended, I attended most religion classes and I read from the Bible. Omar tells us about some of the negative experiences he had in the aftermath of 9-11. Did very well um, until uh, I got a bit older um, towards the 9-11 era. Uh, that that got, got really tough for both me and my parents. Um, my mother just couldn't cope with it, so we packed up and left, you know, because she was just getting... My, my mother used to walk me to school every day, or walk me and my two brothers to school every day, and the amount of people just driving by, and they'd, they'd say something. And eventually, she just couldn't cope with it. We packed up and we went to Australia at the time. Mohanad El Habash tells us of similar experiences. After September 11th, uh, I was in fifth year, yeah, in, and that when I uh, the next day in school, I got so much abuse and stick. Look what your Arab Taliban's law are doing. They're pretty much destroying everything, destroying everything. Like, and did the teachers do anything about it? The teachers did nothing. Teachers got me uh, faced like a man, and I remember I pretty much had an, uh, like I, I nearly had a fight with one of my teachers over it like and then after I got uh, Dean's attention which I got suspended for three days for it because he said something he said one thing wrong to me about religion and I just lost it so I actually I hit my hurdy stick Thankfully the majority of Omar's experiences in Ireland have been broadly speaking positive he tells us of one such example Thank God I've got a, I've got a great tutor tutor in Costa Dula she's absolutely great lady she, she, she knows that I'm Muslim and I I talked to her at the beginning of the year and she, she empties a classroom for me to pray when I need it and she's even printed out for me uh, uh, please do not disturb Excellent. signs and she gave me blue tack so I can hang it up whenever I need to so I, I thought that was absolutely brilliant I've, I've, never actually, I've never actually faced that kind of treatment before but again she's an absolutely great lady As Jamal Badawi Professor Emeritus at St Mary's University in Canada said Islam is not identical with the actions of its followers like other religions, followers are imperfect, fallible human beings. This series was produced and researched by Peter Carney. It was edited by Peter Carney and Alan Weldon. I'd like to thank everybody who took part in the making of this series. In particular, I'd like to thank all those who gave me their time and shared their experience. I hope the experience they shared has taken you a step closer to understanding Irish Muslims.